we next look at Einstein's work in what's called the photoelectric effect. This is one of the famous, three famous papers that Einstein published in 1905. So it was known that when you shine a light on a piece of metal, on polished metal, electrons can jump off of the metal. So the light, which carries energy, liberates electrons on a piece of metal, and those electrons can be, then be accelerated across the gap by some potential difference. And those electrons, as they jump across the gap, can cause current to flow. So the photoelectric effect is an analysis of how light creates electricity. So Einstein found from this photoelectric effect that light is actually comprised of small packets of energy called photons. And those photons have to have very specific minimal energies. In other words, photon energies are quantized. The energy of a given photon depends on its frequency. So we've seen this equation before. The energy of a photon is equal to Planck's constant h times the frequency of light. Or if you don't have the frequency of light and you know the wavelength, just recall that the speed of the wave c is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. So the frequency is equal to c over the wavelength. Solving that for frequency, right? divide both sides by wavelength, you get this. Substitute that in. The energy of the photon is Planck's constant times the speed of light over the wavelength of light. So if you know the wavelength of light, this equation will give you the energy of the photon. If you know the frequency of light, this equation will give you the frequency. Planck's constant, we talked about in the last video, is a constant 6.626. I think your book might say 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. But joules is an energy uh, unit, that's the SI unit for energy, but it's a very big unit for energy, right? Joules, we're talking about the energy of a baseball moving can be measured in joules. The kinetic energy of a baseball, the kinetic energy gained by lifting a kilogram mass up some, you know, some height can be measured in joules. So when you're talking about joules on atomic scales, the joule is a really, really, really big unit of energy. It's kind of like measuring the weight of an atom in kilograms. Kilograms, or sorry, the mass of an atom in kilograms. A kilogram is a unit of mass, but it's a unit of mass that's more appropriate for our everyday world and not very appropriate for the quantum realm. So, a new unit we're introduced here called the electron volt. EV means electron volt where one electron volt is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So it's a very small unit of energy, but it's more appropriate for talking about atomic transitions and photon energies. So the electron volt will be a common unit of energy that we'll be using in this section. Even though it has the word volt in it, it is not a potential, it is not an electric potential, it is a unit of energy. And Planck's constant in terms of electron volts is 1.4, sorry, 4.14 times 10 to the minus 15 electron volt seconds. So plug that in here. You have the frequency in hertz or the wavelength in meters, the speed of light in meters per second, and the energy will come out in either joules if you use the Planck's constant on the top, or electron volts if you use the Planck's constant here on the bottom. So the photoelectric effect, it's best to go over that using a very excellent uh, video um, app that I will link to and sort of talk my way through it from the uh, PHET site. So that's what we'll be going to next. You'll hear my voice and see me working on this video, uh, this, this applet, and explain the process of the photoelectric effect. So this app, this photoelectric app I show here, comes from the PHET website, and there'll be a link to it uh, on D2L where you can play around with it yourself. You will need to install JavaScript, the Java Runtime Environment, G J R E, in order to run it on your computer locally. Uh, but let's go through what this app does. So this app has a light up here that shines light down when it's on. Right now the intensity is 0%, so there's no light coming from this lamp. The light will shine on this bit of metal here, this greenish bit of metal. 
That is currently sodium. And I can down here and choose, change it to copper, platinum, zinc. We'll stay with sodium. When light strikes the sodium, electrons will be released. Those electrons will move across this gap, hit this other plate. So when electrons move through a circuit, that is a current. So let's see what happens. Let's turn the intensity up. Electrons are being ejected from the sodium flying across the gap. Now, in reality, of course, they would fly in all different directions. We're only showing the ones with a maximum energy flying across, and we have some current down here, 0 0.141 amps. So what this shows is that photons are released when light is shown on this metal piece of metal. Now, there are two ways I can change the light shining on this bit of sodium. I can change the intensity. I can lower the intensity and I can change the color of the light, effectively changing the energy of the light. Ultraviolet light or purple light, very high energy because it's high frequency. Going down here, the red portion of the spectrum and infrared light, very low energy. So let's look at the intensity first. If I cut the intensity in half, see how the current got cut in half but the electrons are still moving at the same speed. I just have fewer of them. So by changing the intensity of the light, I change the number of electrons that are ejected, but I don't change the energy that the electrons are ejected at. This is a bit counterintuitive, right? If light carries energy with it, and energy is shown down on this sodium plate, by cutting the intensity in half, I just halved the amount of energy, basically, that is shining on this sodium plate. And understandably, the current got cut in half, but the energy of the individual electrons doesn't change. So what must change is the number. So I'm ejecting fewer electrons and of course, if I continue to drop the intensity down, say 25%, current again got cut in half again. It's a quarter of what it was. You can see the electrons, there are fewer electrons flying across, but they still have the same energy, same kinetic energy. Electrons are still moving at the same speed. So the intensity does not affect individual electron energies. It just affects the number of electrons that are being ejected. All right, let's put the intensity back to 100% and let's play with the color. So here now I can change the color. I can go into the ultraviolet. Watch what happens when I move into the ultraviolet. The current goes up and now the electrons you can see are far more energetic. As I reduce the frequency You can see how the electrons slow. It's slower and slower, and eventually I get to a point where no more electrons are being ejected. So at 541 nanometers here for sodium, this green light shining on this sodium plate, no electrons are being ejected. Now, this was a bit troubling for Einstein and for his compatriots because there's still energy being deposited on this metal plate. So why doesn't that energy want to eject any electrons? Shouldn't that energy build up over time? As you shine light on it over a long period of time, energy will build up and eventually one electron will be kicked out. An analogy would be, imagine a bus that has, let's say, you have to have a dollar to get on the bus. A bunch of people show up with less than a dollar. Eventually, if they pool their money, at least one of them can ride the bus. Eventually, enough people will show up with, say, a dime. After 10 people show up with a dime, that's a dollar. One person can ride the bus, get on the bus, and leave. What the photoelectric effect shows us is like a bus, most people don't pool their money when they go to the bus. They either have enough money to ride the bus or they don't. So photons leaving the lamp here and striking the metal plate 
have a specific energy. How much energy? Well, I have the wavelength here, 541 nanometers. Plugging it into the equation, E is equal to HC over lambda. I can figure out what the energy is for each photon of light. That is not enough energy to liberate a sodium electron. If I increase the energy slightly, 535 nanometers, hey, I'm liberating electrons now. And you can see that they're traveling very, 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 very slowly. So there is a relationship between the wavelength of light and whether or not electrons can be freed from a material. And that's material dependent. 541 nanometers is not enough to eject electrons on sodium, but it would be enough to eject electrons on silicon, for instance. So different metals have different what are called binding energies. And your book goes into the binding energy. The binding energy is how much energy do you need to liberate an electron. Whatever energy remains goes into the kinetic energy of the liberated electron. So you can see that these electrons don't have much kinetic energy. Most of the energy of the photon when it strikes this plate goes into freeing the electron and only a tiny bit of energy is left over that goes into the kinetic energy of the, of the liberated electron. If I kick up the energy, now these photons here are far more energetic. They kick off electrons. They liberate electrons. It's the same amount of energy to liberate an electron, but these go much faster. An analogy, not a great analogy, but an analogy would be a taxi cab. Most taxi cabs have a minimum, okay, it's $10 to ride the cab and $1.50 per additional mile. If you don't show up with $10, you're not even getting in the taxi cab. Just like if you show up with less than the energy to less than the binding energy of an electron on the material, the electron is not going to leave the material. If you show up with a taxi cab with exactly $10, you can get in the cab, you hand $10 to the driver, and then basically you have to get back out because you have no extra money to go that, you don't have any extra money to go any further than just getting into the cab. If you show up, a photon shows up with the appropriate amount of energy to liberate the electron, great, it liberates the electron, but the electron just sits there. It doesn't have any additional energy to go anywhere. And then finally, if you show up at the taxi cab with a $100 bill, more than enough to get in and drive, the more money you have, the further you can drive after you get into the cab. For the photon analogy, the more energy your photon has, the faster the electron flies off after it's been liberated. So with the photoelectric effect, what this proves is that light is emitted and absorbed in discrete packets of energy called photons. And that all photons have the same energy at a given wavelength. So all blue photons with a wavelength of, let's go to the blue part of the spectrum here, so a wavelength of, say, 450 nanometers, all those photons have the same energy, which is why all the liberated electrons here have the same energy, same kinetic energy. This is not a behavior that's similar to the macroscopic world, right? In baseball, pitchers don't throw some integer number of miles per hour, right? They don't have to have some set of you're not throwing a 95 mile an hour fastball or a 100 mile an hour fastball, a 105 mile an hour fastball, and a 101 mile an hour fastball is not allowed. You know, that doesn't happen in the macroscopic world. But in the quantum realm, energies, specifically photon energies, are quantized. And Einstein explained and proved that using the photoelectric effect back in 1905.